Welcome to Ausfilm Creatives, a podcast about Australian creatives working behind the camera. My name is Peter Sylvester and I'm your host. Welcome to part two of El Dresner ACS's interview. Last episode, I covered a little bit about his introduction and his television work on Glitch, which you can check out on Netflix, and also Sisters, which aired last year on Channel 10 in Australia. So I'll continue with this episode talking about his feature film work on the film 2067, uh, which is still in post-production at the moment and due out later in the year, and a little bit about working in the industry with other crew and a bit of insight on the industry itself. And moving on to your feature film you've uh, recently f- finished filming, pretty close, called 2067. With that project, what was some of the visual concepts that you and the director wanted to achieve in, in the film? And I'm, I don't know what the budget is, but obviously within that budget constraint as well, What did you have to contend with and how did you try and achieve some of the things that maybe in discussion sounded amazing, but in production it would have cost way too much? Yes, I mean, it's it's a great question because it sums up 2067 perfectly. 2067 is a science fiction film. There's a futuristic element to it. Um, uh, It had what I would consider like a probably a medium, low to medium sized budget for an Australian film. It wasn't bad budget at all, but the project was really, really ambitious. Uh, So, and as we always do in Australia, as you know all too well, is that it doesn't matter what you're doing, you know, especially, probably especially more so when you're trying to do science fiction and high concept kind of stuff, is, you know, you look at all your references and that you, that's what you want to do, right? You want you, your references of Blade Runner, you know, 2049, an original Blade Runner and Arrival and, you know, all these incredible films that were made for hundreds of, you know, at least $100 million, not a lot more. Mm. Um, but it's really hard, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible, I think, to go, well, that one cost $100 million and we've got three, four, five, whatever we've got, so we're going to make, you know, something that's, the 20th as good as that you know you can't do that you just go I want to make that and how I've got to find ways to make that so that was a big challenge but probably in a good way the good thing about the film is that we didn't we didn't really start out going how do we make this film for the money it wasn't really that approach that uh, it was my first feature and the thing I loved most about it I mean I love the whole thing but one of the things I love most is that really early on uh, the producer Lisa Shaughnessy flew me up to Sydney and myself Seth Lani is the writer director, and Jack Leong, the production designer, sat in a room for a week and just talked, uh, and just and Jack did three D diagrams and drawings, and and that was you know you can imagine what that's like, right? It's, it's, for me, it's like one of my favourite parts of the process because you're just imagining and coming up with ideas and dreaming, you know, and um, you know, and Lisa really tried to facilitate that, which was amazing because you know Bruce could have come in halfway through any of those conversations and gone guys, don't be ridiculous, what are you talking about? But it was always about let's, let's work out the best possible film we can make, you know, which is at 100, and then let's, you know, ease it down and work out ways, you know, Seth used to always say, let's just work out the best way of doing it, the smartest way of doing it, rather than go, let's do the cheap, the cheap way. So, um, yeah, so it was, it was an amazing film, but the script, the script, which is, you know, like I said, very high concept, really intricately written, so many into twining webs and you know twists and things like that but a beautifully written script and a really beautiful character script as well I mean it's ultimately it's a story about human survival and a, and one man's struggle and you know the love for his wife and things like that so you know that was an important grounding for the film but um yeah by the same token it's set 50 years in the future there's flying cars there's time machines, there's laboratories, there's underground nuclear cores. I mean, there's every gadget and, you know, high-tech thing you can imagine and you've got to work out a way to do that, you know, on an Australian film budget. So that was a huge challenge. I mean, for the art department, for Jack, it was a massive, massive challenge. And, I mean, we still managed to, you know, build four or five really amazing sets, you know, one incredible one, and, you know, we managed to do 
we shot in Adelaide, which probably helps a bit, but we managed to, you know, do close down streets in Port Adelaide for, for three nights to do, you know, night exterior stuff. And, you know, we did a lot of great stuff, but, you know, th there comes a point where, you know, the money gets really stretched and you, you have to start having those conversations about, all right, we've still got, you know, a whole bunch of stuff to do and the money's drying up and how are we going to get through it? You know, and I mean, even really simple, you know, the, the really simple thing and interesting thing about that film is, is Seth was really adamant. He loves, Seth loves sci-fi. He loves tech. He's a really techy guy. He loves, you know, anamorphic lenses. He, you know, he loves all that stuff. But he was really, really adamant that he was making a, a story about character and about relationships. And so when you get a schedule, right, and you're trying to do a, you've got a scene which is a 30-second scene which on the page or half a page scene that says the two guys climb out of a manhole in the ground onto a city street and the camera pans around to reveal a dystopian apocalyptic world where the, but with bombed out cars and shanty towns and flying vehicles overhead with spotlights and big neon neon LED signs on the walls and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And they walk, they walk along there and uh, something happens for a second and then he goes home. Uh, that's the thing. Mm. Yeah. It's like I'm legend and Blade Runner. Pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> but because that's half a page, right, you, but it's two nights work, you know, essentially. I mean, there's a bit happens after. But so Seth kept, was really worried about getting enough time to do the five-page dialogues, emotional dialogue scene between the two main actors and, you know, me and the first are kind of sitting down trying to work it out and I'm going, well, you know, to, to do this this big street scene, you know, we, I mean, you know it's, it's a lot of lighting, there's a lot of this, steady cam down the street, we're seeing 100 metres of road and we have wide-angle lens, you know, and so it's like, well, how do you get it to give the director enough time to do his emotional five pages in the studio where I'm like, well, the studio is basically kind of pre-lit and I'm just you know, rolling around a couple of things. We can smash through it um, and enough time to do the, you know, this big scene, which, which ultimately in the film is going to go for a minute or something like that. So they were some of the big challenges we had. And then we also, all the, the tech challenges were big ones as well, things that you would never expect to worry about, like shot like they enter the laboratory. But, of course, in this laboratory it has the special airlock door that goes psh and the, the, you know, the dry ice pushes out, stuff like that. So, you know, when you're on take five because the two dudes pulling the pulley on the side of the door and it, oh, it kind of stopped halfway on that one, oh, that one was a bit too quick, oh, that one, the air canister thing didn't go off, you're like, dude, we got to, we've got five minutes of, of stuff to shoot today and we're doing, you know, five, six takes on a door opening because that's the world, you know. But if you go, ah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine, you know that every person watching that film is just going to go, oh god, that looked, that didn't look right. That you know, that that you know, and be pulled out of the story. So that was some of the that was some of the particular challenges on on this one. And I, I mean, I think ultimately, I think we did really, really well. I hope we pulled it off enough that you know people will be involved enough in the story and not not get distracted by any of those things. But that was a that was a big challenge, big challenge for the art department, big challenge for props. Yeah, and a challenge for all of us. A lot of interactive lighting, you know. I mean, it, yeah, it was. <laughs> there was a lot of challenges, but it was it was a fantastic experience. Yeah, and ultimately, as you yeah. know, great actors and a good story, and that's, that's the battle. Always comes down yeah. to that. And uh, how how many weeks was this? Yeah, we ended up only getting five weeks, twenty five days. So once again, that was kind of this whole negotiation of, and I think with you know with some of the things we needed to do and the sets we needed to build some of that, they ended up only managing to do 25 days. So that was really hard. So it became a really tight schedule for, once again, for the kind of stuff we had to do. You know, and we just had, there was, like I said, there was that street scene. We had a scene in a, a thunderstorm, a lightning storm in a forest at night. You know, so we had some big, big logistical scenes and, yeah, that stuff's hard. It takes time. So we were doing a lot of that stuff with less time than we needed. But... You know, somehow we we did manage to get through it. A, a big, I've got to say, a huge, huge part due to the actors, how good they were, how prepared they were, how willing they were to get through stuff quickly or do one or two takes and move on. And that, without that, you know, if you had a difficult actor or just an unsure actor who, 
you know, either didn't know their lines or wasn't wanted to go again or, you know, wanted to discuss every scene and their character all the time, then I don't think it would have been possible. So that was a huge mm. help. Yeah, nice. And with the visual aesthetic, was there something you went with, like a really, really intense low-key lighting or was to try and maybe mitigate some of the extra work you'd have to do in visual effects or, or was it – I mean, I don't think you would have chosen it based on that. Yeah, no, I never tried to kind of hide anything to help to help our visual effects. There's, there's plenty of visual effects in it and we did have to, you know, there was – it was the most I've ever worked with a visual effects supervisor about really working out that fine line between what, because visual effects had, you know, they also didn't have enough money for what they had to do. So it was a really interesting balancing act about what we could do on set and the time we had on set and resources we had versus, you know, what's going to save them thousands and thousands of dollars later. Um, but no, my general approach was, um, I mean, the biggest thing for me is, first of all, that the, the story says that in 2067, this this last remaining city on Earth, um, basically human beings have messed up the planet and there's essentially no more oxygen left. And people have to breathe synthetic oxygen through tanks that's produced by this company. And there's no trees and there's essentially, there's humans are dying out and they're the last pretty much living things on Earth. So when I read that and thought about that, I thought it, it needs to feel very, the, the theme for me was about suffocation. So, you know, essentially essentially a suffocating world. So that informed the visuals quite a lot. So I wanted things, we shot an anamorphic for a few reasons, but one of the reasons we really loved the widescreen was because it was, it was, you know, squishing everything into the frame a bit and it was making, you know, ceilings feel lower and everything feel a bit claustrophobic and suffocating. And I kind of wanted the mood to feel that as well. I mean, it is, it's this dystopian world. I mean, in the first part of the film, it's, it's essentially a world where everybody knows that they've only got, I don't know, if you've probably only got a few years left. So it had to be, you know, gritty and, you know, perspective, moody. But the other thing that I did as well was going on with that lack of light theme is I wanted to make everything feel really artificial. So we basically had no green in any, any, no, green in the art department, no green in the lighting, you know, green was kind of banned from that part of the film. And I wanted everything to feel very, very artificial. So even in this world, even the sun is like very, very smoggy. So the sun can't even, doesn't even really get through. It's like that little, you know, oily yellow dim spot in the sky. So uh, that informed it a lot as well. So I tried to use a lot of LED, tried to use a lot of different colours that I wouldn't, wouldn't use a lot. Um, yeah, and did, did, a lot of, did a lot of stuff like that. Nice. And so with your, as far as the camera um, settings or the camera setup, uh, did you go, f- I mean, it sounds pretty straightforward, but did you want it to have more grainy look to it? And and also as far as the, 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 the look that you've kind of developed for the film, um, did you also take away the greens even more? And and I guess the last thing with the, with, uh, you know, like what, uh, what, as far as white balancing it, how, how did you balance that? Did you try to push, try to make it look not like, obviously if you used LEDs with daylight, it, you know, did you want the white light or did you want to go more bluish light? What were some of those things? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, we did, we um, chose to, we shot on the Arri Alexa, we shot on the Alexa Mini in Arri Raw. And um, one of the things that Seth and I talked about a lot at the, at the beginning, just as far as the camera went was, we didn't want it to feel like, because it's futuristic, we didn't want it to feel, you know, sharp and slick and we wanted it to feel gritty and raw. So I definitely embraced noise a lot more than I did. I have tested, um, I tested some, some more film grain you know, stuff to do in the, in the grade. So I didn't end up pushing the ISO too much to get the noise, but I wasn't afraid of it either. So, you know, I was very happy to go, you know, to 1280, even 1600, especially in Arri Raw. Um, when required, but I, but also like when I shoot commercials and I shoot a lot of stuff, I shoot a lot of stuff on the Alexa at 400 because I generally am not a fan of noise and I generally like to keep things pretty clean, but I didn't go below 800 on this. I shot everything at 800 and then every now and again pushed it a bit more because I was happy to, you know, to push the image a little bit more. Um, I definitely underexposed more than I ever would. You know, I'm also usually a DP who, while holding the highlights, I prefer to to be to have it a little bit slightly overexposed and pull it back later. 
but I didn't do that on this, you know, and that was something that I had to, you know, despite the tightness in the chest, I had to keep pushing myself to do and keep telling my gaffer that he's got to keep pushing me to do that as well. Um, I did I did test some LUTs. I did test removing some green, but I ended up basically finding, and I have a bit of a weird thing with LUTs because it kind of feels never the same until you're standing on set. You can test as much as you want. Mm. But we were lucky enough to have a DIT on set so I could play around with stuff with him. But I basically ended up finding that because there was no green in the lighting and no green in any of the production design, that as soon as you started trying to take any green out of the, mm. out of the camera, it just went magenta really quick, like way quicker than you'd ever usually expect. So I kind of just went, okay, well, I don't need to, don't need to worry about that. Um, as far as the colour temperature one was an interesting one because we generally, the world, there's basically two worlds in the film and I probably can't say too much about it now, but the world I was talking to you about before, we um, uh, I kind of went back and forth so many times about it because it's, like I said, it's got that smoggy feel. So we looked at like images of like, you know, Shanghai and some of these um, towns that have you know, a lot of pollution and they all have that very kind of mustardy, browny look to it. And Seth had often talked a lot about a cool, a cool look. And we also had a contrast with another world that happens later in the film. So there was a lot of play with that. But generally speaking, especially for interiors, I always went for a cool, pushed it cooler than usual. Mm-hmm. So I did a lot of, um, a lot of 5,000, 4,500, 4, 4,800, those kind of things. Um, used, um, well, one thing which was my absolute saving grace on the film, which I was so, so lucky to have, is we actually managed to find the guy in the art department. He, was, he actually came on as the art department runner, but he had dabbled a little bit as almost like as a hobby um, in um, rigging up LED stuff through software to a computer and being able to do individual pixel mapping and stuff of LEDs. So when I found out about him, I snapped him up straight away and we ended up using a huge amount of LED strip lighting. Like when I first read the script, I was like, this is what we need, like a science lab and all this kind of stuff. And um, I never thought I'd be able to do it. I, honestly, I thought I'd have a couple of gel dedos with people on dimmers, but I was so lucky that we got that. So in the main set, there was over 200 metres of LED strip lighting, all rigged to this dude's computer. And we could say, all right, do a chase sequence on those ones, make those red, make those blue. And I could literally he'd do them and I'd go, oh, they've got a little bit of green in it, just add a little bit more magenta to that. Or can you cool that one down a bit? Or can you warm that one up a bit? And, you know, we, we didn't have enough time to spend too much time playing around with it but it was fantastic so I could almost you know do a lot of the color stuff through the lighting I didn't you know I didn't have to go oh, we're using tungsten or using daylight so I've got to adjust that too much mm. uh like Apple Storm Ashwood who was amazing as well he yeah. had quite a few little do you know Storm yeah yeah I worked on him on a, on a web series in Sydney in 217 yeah yeah he was so. great so he had uh, some really cool you know you know LEDs and tubes and um, these things I think he called K2s or something. I think they're almost little like party clubby kind of light things, but they change colour. So we got to a lot with colour and I've, I used more different, you know, more reds and ambers and uh, like steel blues and even, you know, purples and stuff like that than, you know, ever I'd ever would have thought would have thought I would. But, um, yeah, we just kind of went for it and, and pushed it and, yeah, hopefully it worked. Yeah, I really look forward to it. That's, uh, uh, some, you know, like... In Australia, especially, we, I don't know, like some of the sci-fi we've done, it's more fantasy than sci-fi. So it will be nice to maybe see something that sounds quite grounded in the science fiction concept in films. Yeah. I mean, my favourite, you know, it's quite funny because I never kind of had a, any particular desire to do a science fiction film or pretty, any genre film for that matter. And, you know, the one thing that I really most liked about this one, like I said, is that it is it is very grounded and it's a, it's a beautiful story. And... You know, it's it's that classic great science fiction where it's not a, it's it's not meant. To, I mean, it doesn't matter that it's about being in the future, or it doesn't matter that it's about time travel, or that it's about aliens or something like that. It's it's all about human relationships and how humans, you know, deal with deal with adversity. You know, it's it's it's, it's say any it's any kind of movie with a bit of action and a bit of you know drama and that, but it happens to have these you know, otherworldly elements to it. So that's what I really loved about it. And that was, you know, really important, important for us to achieve. And, you know, same deal with that, you know, obviously the line's really important in a film like this, but I also didn't want it to be, you know, about that. I didn't want it, I wanted to make sure it's sold, that we created the world and people believe the world, but I did want to make sure that, um, you know, it was, we were telling a story, you know, like any other story, like 
Ben Hall. Like, you know, like the story could have been set 200 years ago, just happens to be set 50 years, mm -hmm. you know, years in the future. So, so that was that was also important as well. And that meant that, you know, while we got pretty techy and geeked out plenty, you kind of had to make sure that, you know, it still, still told the story. And when is it due out, do you know, or they still post-produce you? They're saying it's towards the end of this year. So I think they, they talked about us grading in like June or July and I think they officially handed over to the distributors at like the end of September or something like that. So hopefully before the end of the year. Yeah, hopefully we get a good theatrical release. It's uh, always a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. And uh, now we've talked about, I guess, that your sort of commercial narrative and things like that. Do you, do you have a preferred kind of format to tell stories with or, or as in like one that you really – lock in and enjoy and it's not necessarily about it's better than the other but the one you I guess you really gel with yeah I mean I I do love I do feel very fortunate and lucky and happy that I have the opportunity to do them all I know there's a lot of people who who can't do that and I'm I you know I've never I'm just really glad I can do that I mean if I had to choose I'd definitely say it's feature films it's it's it is my favorite thing to do it's one you know one story it was this one thing that you're you know working intimately with you know with a director and a production designer and everybody for that period of time I, you know, tv's probably a close second and tv's you know come a, such a long way in the last few years that you know there's you know, amazing actors and amazing stories and amazing directors working in tv so i do love doing that as well um you know commercials for me it's a, it's a weird one it's um when i wasn't doing any drama or I was only shooting commercials I thought commercials were the be all and end all and I you know, absolutely loved doing them and I would be just as focused and just as stressed and you know just as desperate to do the best possible job and make everything right in a commercial as I would in a drama but I found now doing all that drama going back to commercials I feel like I have a slightly different relationship with them I enjoy doing them they, obviously they pay well you're working with different people all the time for a few days at a time you get, you know, you generally got a bit more time and money so you can do some cool stuff and use some cool toys and things like that. So I definitely do enjoy it more. And I also feel much more free, I think I said before, to experiment and to, to try things and to push the boundaries more with that. Um, but no, I, I just love the drama. I think just, you know, people ask me all the time, like, do you film like 2067? There was people say, oh, what was your favourite thing? Oh, you know, you did this big, the big massive street scene, with, you know, with all the lighting and all this and you did... The, you know, the storm in the forest, or that, I say, that was all great. I love that stuff. It's all cool. But honestly, when you're shooting a tight close-up of Cody Smith-McPhee, you know, reacting to, I won't tell you what, but some, you know, horrible thing happening or an emotional moment or him and his wife, you know, having this, you know, heartfelt, difficult conversation, you know, to me there's nothing better than that. It's, um, it's you know, by far my, my favourite part of the job and, you know, I could probably never completely remove myself from it, but if I can even 10% of my brain can switch off from being a cinematographer for 10 seconds because I'm so absorbed in a performance, you know, there's, there's nothing better for me. It's, it's, it's my favourite thing. It's why, you know, definitely the, the, the biggest reason that I love doing it and the, the, most, the pu most pure, happiest times I have on set, you know. So I think, and I think... You can, I mean, you can get that in all forms, but obviously in television and even more so, I think in features, you you get to do more of that. Mm. Yeah, it's it's I guess capturing a performance, especially you know, a great actor that can um, really, you know, you, you feel the moment. And in those moments, like I know even for me, like um, when filming some of those or even planning for them. It's so like I think a lot about oh you know it's it's a close up but like really I, I really want to make sure I get that right. It's so weird, but I think so much about those close ups more than yeah the wide shot. Sometimes you're like oh I got to light and plan all this lighting stuff for it and what do we got? Um, but the close ups I find yeah just that that kind of thing where you don't want to push it too much and the lighting has to really try to evoke that emotion and if there's camera movement and it's it's actually very intricate I find doing close-ups yeah absolutely I totally agree and it gets difficult sometimes where you you know we we did a lot of camera movement on 2067 and the camera was a V 
very kind of active participant and very dynamic and stuff like that. So, um, you know, Seth, you know, I, there were, I can't, there's probably half a dozen locked off shots in the, in the whole film or even shots just on tripod. But there is times where you do a, do a real tight close-up of a good actor in an emotional moment and, you know, you're trying to do a perfect dolly move as you do it and you're worried that the focus is, you know, is, is right and all that stuff and you, you can almost get, pulled away from that. And it is, it is a beautiful thing of a slow push into somebody's face and it does draw people in. But, you know, when you're on set, you, you can get, you know, I can find myself sometimes on the monitor and this dude's crying and, you know, and, and all I'm going is, oh, was, was that a dip in focus? Oh, shit, I should <laughs> up a little bit more. Oh, I'm about to get to the end of the slider and I want to keep moving. You know, this, you know, all there's a million things going through your head, you know, and you want to go, look, this guy is just like, thrown open his heart to, you know, to everybody and, you know, and you know, there's nothing worse than when they call cut and the dude's going, wiping away his tears and you have to say, yeah, sorry, I just need another one. We uh, had a little bit of a bump on the, you know, on the slider or something like that. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. I remember shooting a scene where we saw the owner of a house that's just been burnt down and, and walks up to the camera and um, my first AC you know, all, doing an amazing job the entire production. She just wanted to nail this focus and, you know, it was a very intense and emotional scene and, uh, yeah, look, it, it took about six takes and uh, in the end I think they ended up using not the shot that was 100% in focus but just performance-based. Yeah, you see it all the time, all the time. My focus pulled up Bryn Whitty who was on 2016 who did the most incredible job. The guy's an absolute genius at focus, but he was so worried about things being soft and like handheld in a fight scene mm. and me, you know, putting on a 35 mil and sticking it in people's face and stuff like that and everything you go, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I think, I think, oh, I think there was that one bit. I don't think I got that bit. <laughs> I, I understand. I know you, you want to do your job well. And that's all great. I said, but dude, just trust me. It doesn't matter. And I keep, I literally, I come to set every day on Monday morning. I go, I was blocking some TV the other day. And I end up seeing speed on the TV and they cut to this like, Close up of Sandra Bullock, and it's like a loose close up, and they hold it for like 15 seconds, and the whole thing stopped. He's like, What? Really? 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 Like, yeah. <laughs> but it does. It makes me, it almost makes me more inclined to try and remove some of the tech out of it. Mm. You know, I mean, those shots are great and they, they have an emotional response and they're amazing. But sometimes when I do stuff like that, I'm just, I, I actually just go, Are we better off just kind of just sitting here and letting this guy just do his thing? And, yeah, everyone's going to be so absorbed in it anyway because it's so beautiful and so sad. Mm. Yeah, that's it. So sometimes you, I always say sometimes you just have, just hold and let the performance happen because that that's more than enough. As long as it's it, you know the lighting's not dodgy, you know, just even if it's simple lighting, even if you've just got one light and a bounce board, that, that's all you got. But let them do their thing because sometimes yeah, you don't want to ruin it. You know, like you said, take people out of the story. Um, so yeah. So as far as um, talking about working with your crew, is there sort of an approach you like to to go with in uh, when you, I guess, in pre production, but during production as well with your film crew and and obviously the other head of departments and things like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think um, that's critically critically important. I mean, the more I do it, the more I realise how much communication is, you know, almost the most important part of our job. And you know, so. You know, if you want to call it going down, so trying to talk, you know talking to grips and gaffers and camera department and keeping everybody informed so they know what's going on. And so you know, just it just what I've just discovered is the better you communicate and the more information you share kind of accurately and well, it, the better it is for you. The more time you get, you know, there's nothing worse for me now, especially if you're doing drama on tight schedules. Every you know every minute counts. There's nothing worse than standing on set waiting for some annoying thing because, you know, you, you had a misunderstanding or miscommunication and knowing that at the end of the day, that two minutes, you'll be desperate for that extra two minutes because you'll get another take or something. So that is critically important. So I try, I just, I try to, yeah, communicate as clearly as well as I can. I, I certainly, I used to, you know, do a lot of stuff where I think about things and go, oh, I should probably mention that at some point. And now I just go, no, nah, I'm writing an email right now or I'm, you know, doing something. I want to make sure I say it and I'll say it twice if I need to. And, you know, so I do a lot of that. Um, I think along kind of a different thing, but along those lines is I think it's really important to try and get your crew as invested as you possibly can in the production. I mean, it's hard. These guys are working long hours, 
for not great money, you know, and they're working really hard. And, and I think it's really important to try and make sure, you know, they feel invested. You know, just like if a, a director kept, told you every lens to use and said, oh, I don't think that light should be there. I think you should put it there. And that basically did your job for you. You'd feel like, what the hell am I doing here? What, you know, what's the point? And I think, you know, that can happen with crews as well. So I think you want to make sure that they don't just feel like their job is just moving light stands around or carrying shop bags. So I, I do try really hard to keep them involved and encourage them to have ideas and listen to their suggestions. I also do a thing which I recommend to anybody and I always push really hard for it. Um, of at the end of every week on set, I always like to, and I'll sometimes email them if I'm allowed, but sometimes you're not allowed to, but um, so on 2067, at, the, at lunchtime on every Friday, we set up a um, TV screen at lunch and the, have the editor cut, just cut together a little montage of some of the nicest shots we shot that week and just play it at lunch. And I think it's a really great way for people to feel invested and see what their hard work has done, see it paying off. And you just see people just start drifting over towards the next, you know, there's you know, 20 people standing there in front of a monitor talking about stuff and you know, I could just see it lifting people. So I think mm. that's really important as well. And then, you know, upwards, communication. Obviously, communication with the director is is absolutely critical. And, you know, the biggest part of our job is getting inside a director's head and working out what they want to do. And some are better communicators than others. So, you know, I found the best thing about this film, particularly this film, is I spent a lot of time with Seth. I was really lucky because you don't always get that much time with the director as much mm. as you would like you know same with Matt I mean that experience that you guys had that you spend so much time together for so long so that when you come to shooting it you essentially know exactly what they want and you know what their intentions are and it it actually allows you to do your job so much better because you don't have to if someone comes and asks you a question if a grip says oh what do you think we we, we need a track on this scene you don't need to then go oh I'll just check I'll just check with the director I'll just oh I think you know you can actually go well, we've spoken about, not even this scene, but we've spoken about the general way we want to move the camera. We've spoken about how we want to motivate certain parts of the film. We've, we've gone through every single scene and worked out what this scene means and what we need to say in this scene, you know, and what are the mo- most important moments. So once you do all that and, you know, you, know, you feel like you, you are inside, that you're kind of thinking on the same wavelength, you, you know, everything just becomes so much quicker and so much easier. So that's critically important. Mm-hmm. And then, like we said before, so make sure you express your views and not being afraid to, you know, say, I don't think it's the right approach. I think we need to do it this way. Um, and the office, that's the, that's the other really big one, the produ- or producers and line producers and production people in the office. And that's another one where I used to be really hesitant to ask for things. You know, I used to do a lot of stuff where I'd go, oh, I kind of think we should probably, I should probably have this, but I'm not 100% sure, but maybe. And now I'm just, you know, I'm just like you can't stuff around with that stuff. And I've also realised that the earlier you ask for something, the more likely you are to get it. So I think being really clear and open with them and just, you know, it's really, the, the um, relationship with the line producer is, is really huge. You've got the hardest job in the world. All they do have to do is say no to people all the time. Mm work out a good relationship with them where you've got an understanding that you'll only ask for something if you need it, you know, and if they really can't afford it, they'll say, I'm really sorry, I can't do it. It's a really great relationship to have and it helps helps a film and any, any production a lot. So, yeah, I mean, communication is hugely important and just, yeah, be clear and don't be afraid to, you know, ask questions or say you don't know or, you know, those kind of things. If you can take the ego out of it as well, mm. it's also that also is going to help. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I don't, I have this um, motto that, you know, I try to include and not necessarily spell it out, but just behave that way is that the day that you put yourself uh, number one on set, that's the day that the f- film starts failing, you know, and that yeah. happens from, doesn't matter which department, whether it's in front of the camera, behind, if someone starts doing that, it just affects everybody. And so yeah. that's really important in, in communication as well to try and be yeah. very, open and make sure that, um, you know, everyone is really feel like they're, they're, they're doing their part and they get to really be solid and, and be focused on that part and not have to contend with other crap. Um, Absolutely. So. Absolutely. You just got to understand as well, everybody's got their job to do, right? The makeup artist has to make sure they do their job and they, you know, they can look at it later and not go, oh, crap, you know, and the, and the wardrobe person and, 
you know, everybody has a job to do. Everybody's trying to do their best, the best job they can. And, you know, the balancing act is respecting that, but also, you know, being strong enough to go, I'm really sorry, but, you know, if we don't shoot this in the next minute, you know, if we're not shooting it at all or something like, you know, or being able to stand up for yourself as well. And even in relationship with like camera and grips and, and lighting, I like to get on well with my crews. I like to be friends with them. I like, I always go and like have a beer at the back of the grip truck at the end of the day and go and say thank you to everyone. But you also, also need to make sure you maintain that relationship where you can go, all right, come on, what's going on? You know, we need to hurry up. This is, you know, we, we need to pick it up, whatever you need. It, it is that fine line. Mm of being, you know, too matey with everyone, like we're, you know, we're out here having a, you know, having a party, but but also keeping, you know, keeping people on side. That's all important. You need yeah. people moving in the right direction, work, wanting wanting to work hard, you know, for you and for the project. Cause it's, mm. it's hard, you know, if you don't have that. Yeah, definitely. You don't, you don't want to, I guess everyone, even if they're not necessarily a creative role, if they've read the script and, you know, they, they, you want them to stay connected with telling the story and be part of telling that story. So that's Yeah, it. and the, the perfect point because the other thing as well about that is then what you find is people don't really feel connected to it. You'll see things that, that mistakes happen, like things not be ready, like you'll go into a set and you'll go, oh, okay, so now we're going to do the thing where he pulls on the lever. And if the person's just gone, someone said to them, oh, yeah, you got to put a lever in the set and they just whacked it, you know, wherever then you go, well hold on what's it doing there because it specifically says you know he moves from here or whatever you know, so little mistakes start to creep in which costs time and costs you know the story and the maze so the more you can keep people involved so they're actually you know not just you know taking orders from other people but actually thinking about it you know, you're you know it's much much better yeah definitely and uh, uh we we'll switch up a bit and uh, talking about the the australian industry particularly um some of the i guess even with my experience, you know, it's, it's a tough thing if you're not in the place. But um, the limited options, I guess, the Aussie filmmakers have to, it's not like you can't go and make a film because you can go get an iPhone and if you, like you said, you write a clever script that, or a really engaging script and you just go and shoot it, you know, and as long as it's executed fairly, you know, at a good level, professional level, it can be an amazing piece of work. So, there's no excuse for that, but again, you can't just keep working for free either. So, that's sort of how do you feel about the Aussie industry right now for Aussie filmmakers and so many, I guess, going overseas? Yeah, it's 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 very difficult. It's it's such a it's such a tricky question and such a huge question for the industry. And I think you know people will be talking about that for a long time. It's, I mean, it's we're in a difficult situation because we are a very very small market ultimately. And even without the issues of Australians not even going to see Australian films, we we've only had 25 million people to to sell a film to anyway. If it if it can even be watched by all you know by all those people, so that's that's already put us in a difficult position, right? So that means that funding is hard because you know we are actually extremely lucky in Australia that our government funds films. Mm. Uh, they have things, you know, which I think should be a lot more of. Like I think in Western Australia, they have a, a Screen West lottery or West lottery or something. So they do a lottery and that funds films and other countries do that. I think that's brilliant. But, you know, if we didn't have, if the government didn't fund Australian films, I mean, I think how many films would actually be made? Because from a business perspective, if someone came up to you and said, all right, I need $3 million and I'm going to make a film. And if you look at, history speaking for the time of type of film we're going to make with the type of actors who are in it and the the creative people who are in it 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 might make a hundred grand at the box office you know and maybe i don't know maybe it'll make a million bucks all up once it goes through all the other different platforms and different things i mean no one's who's no businessman's going to invest in that so we're in a really difficult situation where we have an industry which people aren't doing it for the money most people aren't doing it for the money Mm. You know, it's not, it's not a it's not an industry where people say, "Well, I'm happy to do that, even though you know it's whatever, because I'll make money out of it, or you know, or I'm not going to do it because I won't make money out of it." So you see it through from the top to the bottom. So from the very top of trying to make films, you've got this issue where, you know, it's very hard to get private investing. I really hope that the streaming services help with that. You know, that's a really huge opportunity, and starting to see Netflix and even Stan and people are starting to um, 
make feature films and get success with feature films is is fantastic and the TV stuff. So that's a, a really big opportunity and something I think, you know, I hope will continue. But failing that, it, it's really hard. You know, it's really, really hard. And, the, and even when you do get Screen Australia or government or state agency to invest in a film, they, of course, they want the film to be good, but it's not like in Hollywood where a studio exec can visit a set and they can go, oh, we're behind schedule, behind budget, and they go, all right, we'll give you another half a million bucks because it's a great film and it's going to be good, but they, they can't do that. So, you know, you can't, you know, we had this experience almost on 2067 where you're four weeks in and they're going, we are so, so close to the bottom of the barrel here money-wise, we just got to try and get through that last week. And Screen Australia can't go, oh, you're so close and what you're shooting is great. Yeah, we'll throw in a bit of, a bit of extra money. So it's hard. It's really, really hard. And the, what you see moving down the line for that with crews is you've got all these crews who most people in this industry, not all of them, but most people in this industry, especially people in our position and in the higher creative positions, are doing it because they love doing it and they don't want to do anything else. And ultimately, as long as they can pay the bills, they'll, they'll do it for nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult situation as well because, you know, whether it's subconsciously or consciously or so that, you know, producers and those people can get people to work for very little or nothing because, you know, you get to work on a feature film. So that's also hard. And I think I think it's hard for them as well because they're just as desperate as us to make a great film. Everybody wants, like I said before, you know, we, we're making a whatever budget Australian sci-fi film, but you don't want to, you don't want to compromise. You know, you want to make the best film you can make. You want people to watch it and watch an American sci-fi film and go, I thought they were, they were just as good as each other, you know, something like that. You don't want to, you don't want to give up too early. So the only way to do that is to get people to go above and beyond and people to do more than, you know, what they really are getting compensated for. Mm. You know, so handle not the best conditions or, you know, make do with less or get paid less or, you know, even with grips and lighting, I see it all the time, you know, they, they, they get, so much amount of money for gear and then they end up going, oh, I end up just throwing in a whole bunch of extra gear of my own because I knew you needed it and, you know, mm. and, you know, just, and, yeah, it's hard. It's hard for them because it's very hard for them also to quantify, you know, what every light is worth or what, you know, what being able to do a track in a scene versus not being able to do a track in a scene is actually worth financially. So that's really difficult. Um, you know, so it's hard. And there's a lot of people who want to do it, not in every state. But in places like Sydney and Melbourne, you know, there's so many directors and so many DPs. And so you've got a huge amount of competition and, um, you know, not a huge amount of projects, a huge, a huge amount of money. So it's, it's difficult. And I think it's probably true of most creative industries. You know, there's probably a whole bunch of singer-songwriters going, oh, you know, if just, if just there'd be more people who, you know, I don't know, put on, play live music or, you know, more people would buy albums or that kind of stuff. So... I think anything creative where you're doing something that you're super passionate about and you're doing something which, you know, is actually, you know, for the love of it, you're not actually doing it for the money, but you're trying to make a career out of it, that's that's really difficult. And so obviously people go overseas because Australians are valued overseas. They get a lot, you know, they get a lot of work because they know how to do more with less. They don't do the American DP thing where I meet every piece of equipment on set at all times just in case I need it. You know, they go, oh, we don't need a techno crane. What's that doing here? You know, so they love the Aussies because everything's pretty chilled and laid back and they do a great job. And obviously the opportunities are, are great for them there. You know? And once you start seeing some be successful, then more can be successful. And, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of Aussies sitting not doing a lot, but there, um, there are more opportunities there, you know, and they're, they're selling to 300 million people. So obviously you've got more people going it's, it's worth taking a risk. So it's, it's hard. I don't know what the answer is. I hope winning is one of them. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, it's just one of those things that for us we'll just, you know, keep doing it because <laughs> we either don't have anything else to do or, you know, we want to do it so bad that we'll just find a way, you know. And that, that means that, you know, you are, you, there is always a chance that you get taken advantage of because, you're more willing to let yourself get taken advantage of because you want to do it anyway. Yeah, you know, I mean, this film's a great example. Everyone, 
HODs got paid award wages. The money was, you know, not not great. But, you know, and I didn't tell them this, but the fact is it was my first feature. I was desperate to do one. It was a good script and a decent feature to start with. If they'd said, we want you to shoot this feature but we can't pay you a cent, I still would have done. Mm. I would have found a way to do it. You know, so it's, you know, that's difficult because then what do you, what do, you do then when, when you're willing to essentially do it for nothing but you've still got to find a way to, to pay the bills, you know? Yeah, and uh, it's a... Uh, it's, uh currency not necessarily money for for us like even with ben hall for me it was to come back to the film industry and i'd been running video production for almost uh, eight or ten years or something like that and you know i kind of felt the right moment i've had enough enough experience life experience and and you know technical experience to get back in the film industry you know my currency was that i, I needed to get back in the film industry and show what i'm capable of especially with the limitations we had and trying to push my own boundaries and, and just trying to make complete a feature film, you know, it's not easy even just finishing one. So. Ben Hall's a perfect example, right, because there's a whole bunch of people who turned up every day, whatever accommodation and locations and all that kind of stuff was, you know, not getting paid very much and, you know, everyone was just wanted to be there. Everyone wanted to make a film. Everyone was invested in it. The actors, you know, were invested in it, everybody. So it... Um, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, it's an amazing, beautiful, collaborative thing to see all these people going out there for very little to just because they want to create something, and it's fantastic. But it's, I don't know. Is it how? I don't know how sustainable. How sustainable? You know. And then the other tri- difficult part, you know, then or another perfect example, right? Is that you make a film like that for not a lot of money, you know, with the crew that are, you know, doing it for the love of it, and then you make a really, really good film. But in Australia, because it's not an amazing film with people that characters of people, actors of people recognise, still not a lot of people go and see it, right? So it it's not doesn't become financially successful, you know, which does mean that you know it's 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 harder to go. Let's you know, let's make another one, you know. And if you make another one, do you have to make it the same way? Do you have to then go back and go? We got to make another film for love, you know, with everyone. It's, it, what you want it, what you hope. And it does happen sometimes, but not enough, is that you do the love one, everyone gets together and makes this great film, and it's appreciated enough that someone goes, wow, you guys did an amazing job. I'll find some money so you can do it again and get and get paid a reasonable mm. amount. But yeah, unfortunately, exactly. that, that doesn't happen enough. Well, it's like you watch, uh, you know, so I like watching some of those um, well-produced uh, uh, chef kind of shows, uh, Chef's Table, and then there's another one I was watching. And... Um, you know, and you look at those guys and they go, oh, you know, I, I opened my restaurant five years, but first four years, it's I, we, we didn't know how we were going to survive. Like, you know, so you, there is obviously that level that you've got to accept that you've got to just really work hard for nothing for a while, um, yep. but you've got to pay bills too. Um, so there's that. But I guess uh, the, the tricky part for Australia at the moment is, 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 like you said, there's just so many filmmakers from all different aspects um, available, and then we have a lot of film courses that's punching out, you know, thousand, two thousand students a year um, into the market, and there's just not enough work for them. So, I mean, obviously, there's, you know, it can be looked at, and I think streaming right now, if if we jump on it, you know, I think there's Tidelands, an Aussie produced Netflix series that was done here in Brizzy. Um, so, you know, there's opportunity, and I, I hopefully. Um, streaming is kind of a, a almost like a win-win situation for filmmakers because you don't have to worry about uh, box office. That's per se. Correct. You do have exactly. to you do have to hope that like Netflix or Amazon or whoever is putting up the money there actually accept it because if they don't, <laughs> you're stuck with a bill. But but still, that hasn't really happened. So hopefully, streaming is the is where where it's at. And yes, I know like people argue about. Oh, cinemas are getting destroyed. No one's, but I think that part of it is to do more with the cinema business and them not playing it very smart because they could easily survive and 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 screen a lot more films, you know, offer a much better price and not just be, you know, waiting for the studio, the major studios to go. Oh, here's a big blockbuster for the next two months. Yeah, that that's very true. I mean, the other thing though, I think as well though is, unfortunately, I mean, I've got a thirteen and eleven year old daughters and 
I think sometimes it's, you know, you get to be realistic about it and they watch TV on their phone, right, or their laptop. And I've seen, I've gone downstairs before and seen them sitting on the couch in front of the 50-inch TV watching Netflix on their laptop. And I'm go, uh, why are you watching Netflix on your laptop? There's a big TV right there. And they go, oh, I'm not happy to watch my laptop. So I think we also, you also need to understand, we need to understand that, you know, especially the younger generation, people are changing. And to be honest, they, they don't, I feel almost like they don't appreciate the cinema, the big screen experience like we did, like past generations did, and some probably would. But, you know, they, they're, they're watching stuff on, you know, on whatever. And it, it kind of, it does change the game a bit. And it's a, it's a real shame. And hopefully cinemas find their place and they do find enough place for people to watch it because you want to do that. But the one thing that, like, for example, Stan produced a film called um, The Second, I think also shot in Queensland. And it was the same, so they had a cinema release, like for two weeks, and then they went on to Stan after that. And, and I know Netflix have done that a lot in the States. I mean, Roma, like, look at Roma and um, what's the film that got nominated for the Award last year, I can't remember, but um, oh, Mudbound. So, you know, we, opportunities like that are great. So you go and make a film with Netflix, you get your cinema release for a couple of weeks. And I would imagine, especially a film like Roma, yeah. that'll probably stay at the cinema because it's so successful and it's now going to get awards and stuff. So that'll continue at the cinema. But so you've got that cinema experience for people who want it and you can promote that, but then it's also on a streaming service and people, you know, someone can watch it on their mobile phone if they if they really want it, which is, you know, depressing, but it happens. So at least that's you know, at least that's offering something for people and it's private private investment. Um, I think the government might be involved as well, but it's um it's an opportunity because you say with the the students it's the reason there's so many film students is because it's something that people really want to do. Mm. People are desperate to do it, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not like most other jobs where you're going, I'm going to go to uni and become a lawyer, get a law degree, become a lawyer because it's a, I like it and it's a good solid job and it'll pay well and, you know, it's it's different. You know, I say it's people are, are doing it for different reasons. So that always, it's always going to make it difficult. Um, but, you know, they've been doing it for a while now and they'll keep doing it. So, mm. you know, as people, people continue to get to do it. So in saying that, uh, with as far as uh, your projects, I mean, I guess for you because you've worked in a commercial world, you've probably kept fairly busy. But I guess how do you balance that with your, your lifestyle and, and having two children, um, you know, a family? And, and it, because, I mean, for me, like I know, uh, with Ben Hall, that probably was the hardest shoot I'd been on because, like, I came back from that and for a month I was just dead. Like, I just kind of couldn't do yeah. anything. So, I guess, how do you maintain a lifestyle in that in that sense, a personal lifestyle? It's it's really really difficult, and it goes back to to filmmakers in general, films like us who you know, are so loved doing it and are so keen to do it, and it is their passion that. You know, yeah, you've got a got a family, you've got a wife and kids, and yes, you want to spend time with them, and you want to, you know, pr- provide for them not financially, but physically. You know what what they need, and be there for them, and be part of their lives, and part of their growing up. And and unfortunately, this business, first of all, you do miss a lot of things. You miss concerts, and you miss school stuff because you're working and you're working long hours, and you you know can't organise dinners because you're not sure what time you're going to wrap and all that kind of stuff. But it, do, it impacts a lot and it's difficult. And like I was saying before about Glitch, which was the biggest thing for me that, I mean, they knew it was my first big series and it was a big opportunity for me. But, and, you know, you also need a very incredibly understanding partner. But on Glitch, I would, we'd, a lot of our locations were an hour, an hour and a half away from Melbourne. So with the 10-hour shoot day and travel and lunch, you'd be basically doing 12, 13-hour days. I'd get home, I'd watch Rushes straight away for an hour or two, and then I'd prep for the next day. And by that time, it was like, you know, 10 or 11 at night, I'd go to bed and I'd get up and go to work. And I literally, I was in home, staying at home, working in Melbourne. And for four months, I virtually didn't see my family. I saw them on a Saturday, even on Sundays, I used to half straight through Sunday, I'd go, I just got to go and prep for the week and get everything ready and organised. And that was really hard on them. And I didn't realise I was just completely focused and set blinkers on and I didn't realise at all. And my wife was amazing about it. And afterwards, like a month after I recovered, she said, that was really, really hard, and it actually would have been easier if you weren't, if you were away, because you were there, but you weren't there. So that's when what I did was then I went on to do Sisters, and I kind of went, okay, I've got to 
I've got to find a way to make this work. And yes, it was a bit less stressful, easier shoot. But what I did then was I decided that when I got home from work, I would ne- not do anything related to the show when I got home. So I'd get home at seven or whatever it was, and I'd do spend a couple of hours just being dad and being the husband and doing the family thing. And I'd get up an hour, an hour and a half early in the morning, and I'd do, I'd do rushes and prep and stuff then. And, you know, it kind of felt harder in a way, but it was much, much better. And I got to chill and stop thinking about it for a couple of hours at night. And it was a much, much better experience and much better for the family. So it's really, it's really, really hard, you know, really hard. I mean, I finished 2067. I've been earlier this year, I was shooting a documentary in Cambodia, actually, which was great, really cool experience. And I got an email from the producer saying they want to go back and do a bit of extra stuff we didn't get. And they... You know, I finished on the 7th of December and they wanted me to go from the 9th to the 23rd of December. And my first reaction, in my mind, I'm like, oh, I'd love to go to, I'd love to go to Cambodia and finish the documentary. You know, I started, I want to see it through and it was a great experience. But I'm like, I, I, that's ridiculous. I can't do that. You know, you, you just, you have to make decisions, you know, and it's harder because most of the things you get asked to do, you really want to do. You don't want to say no, especially if it's a good project, especially if it's good for your career and all that. So, you have to make some difficult decisions sometimes and you have to go, you know, I got to the point where I was traveling a lot in for commercials, going to Queensland, going to Sydney and things like that. And I had to say, I've got to start turning some stuff down. You know, it's not great. So good financially and maybe not best for the career, but you sometimes you just have to do it because you know, you've got to make sure you look after that stuff. Cause I know this industry is, is pretty hard on relationships at the best of times. So it's, um, yeah, it's definitely one of those things, but it's, it's hard, you know, like, I've got an agent now and, you know, I say to her stuff like, oh, you know, so it'd be better to try and find something in Melbourne, but, you know, studio. and then, so the thing in Melbourne is some TV show that I'm like, oh, I'm not, doesn't really sound very good. I don't really want to do it. And there's, oh, she, well, this is other great show when it's really good, but that's shooting in Queensland or something. So, you know, you just go, oh, okay, great. So it's hard. I don't know there's a perfect solution, but I just think just as long as you're aware of it and, you know, you understand that, you know, they make a lot of sacrifices for you. so you sometimes got to make some sacrifices for them mm. and probably uh even for your own self though, i think it's important for a mental uh stability i guess that you know if you're you don't realize but you do all those all that work and it, you do it can fall into the trap of you know really disregarding your own mental health as well and yeah. it can be dangerous no, that's very true. And the other thing I was got really aware of when I did my first couple of series is that you more hear about, I've seen a bit, you more hear about, you know, some DPs who shoot, you know, television or time and, and it's a job for them, right? They, they enjoy it. They like doing it, but essentially it's a job, you know, turn up, shoot, you know, shoot the show, do the, do the, do the go. They don't overly stress about it. They want it to be good and all that, but they kind of get in a bit of a routine with it. And I was always really aware of going, I never want to be, I never want to be like that. I never want to turn up for anything and just, and just dial it in. Yeah. So you're right. From what you're saying, exactly true. I think sometimes you need to fit your career as well and your mental health go, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to recharge the batteries. So then when I do take the next project, then I can really get into it properly and do it, mm. do it right. Wow. So I guess, how do you, how do you stay inspired? I, I, I assume obviously family is a big one in a way, but as far as creatively, what are some of the things that keep you motivated to? Yeah, I, every time I go to the movies, I, I walk out inspired almost every time. I, um, I have a thing where I watch a film, and if an enjoyable film, and as the credits roll, I just, you know, still imagine myself in the credits and go, oh, how amazing would it be to have been part of something like that? So everything I watch inspires me, you know, even – art and photography and books even inspire me and you know looking at other people's work I know that are doing amazing work inspires me to be better but um you know everything really every uh, any you know looking at a beautiful sunset or you know cool reflection in a building it's I get it from so many places and you know having said that in all honesty I, I have a really really strong desire to be you know, as good as I can possibly be and do the best work I can do and work on the best projects I can work on. And that is inspiration to, and drive to, to, you know, step up into to the next level and the next level after that. But, um, yeah, I get, I don't know, just honestly the best watching a film, a good film, and, you know, and getting an emotional response and seeing other people get an emotional response to a film is 
for me, there's nothing, there's nothing better than that. You know, that's, I love stuff like, you know, Matthew Liberty getting nominated for a Golden Globe for A Star Is Born and you watch that movie and, you know, it's not a cinematographer's film. There's nothing flashy in it. There's heaps of stuff where they're, I don't think they're wearing any makeup and they're shiny and, you, you know, I look at a lot of it going, man, it looks very stripped back and there's not a lot in it. But I think it shows you that people do appreciate beautiful storytelling and beautiful work, emotional work. And, you know, even if it, that's a lot of that's come from the acting and the script and the directing, it doesn't matter, but you're part of it. And, you know, to move people like that is, uh, that's, um, that's the best thing. Mm. That's, that's what I, do. I mean, it shows up where, with uh, Matthew Libertique that, you know, that he, he knows the boundaries to make sure he doesn't cross them because, you know, he's seen his other previous work and it's extremely intense, powerfully as far as the cinematography is very strong and yeah. then he can step back and go actually the style is that we don't do any of that stuff because then yeah. you're not letting the story be the story so yeah it's it's great to really be inspired by that kind of thing so putting yourself watching those movies and you see those credits is there any projects where you're like i'd really love to work on something like that yeah it's i've thought about that a lot because i see that and hear that question a lot and I think I mentioned before, is I've never, ever had a desire for like any particular genre. I've never been one of those people who kind of says, I'd love to do a Western or love to do a sci-fi or love to do that kind of thing. Honestly, I could feel at the moment, I feel like I'd be so thrilled and happy to make, you know, emotional character, relationship, drama kind of stuff forever. You know, I, I, it's, it's weird. I mean, I love all types of movies and, you know, I get, have inspired or emotion, have emotional responses to lots of different movies. And I love the way something like sci-fi can talk about human nature and the human spirit in a different way. But I gravitate a lot of the time towards mainly depressing kind of, you know, tough relationship drama, things like, you know, Blue Valentine or Una or things like that, which are difficult subjects and somebody going, you know, going through difficult times and trying to deal with it. And, you know, things like Our Star is Born is a good example as well. You know, films like that, that, you know, I, that, those are the kind of films that I, that I really want to make. Mm, right. And uh, so out of that, what, is there a favourite film that really connects with you? Yeah, I mean, it's probably, yeah, I don't know if it quite goes into the, what I just said earlier, but for some reason, I mean, I, there's classic films that I love. I love films like Apocalypse Now and I love The Godfather and films like that. But the one I go back to again and again, the one that when I go, oh, I think I'm going to watch that again, is No Country for Old Men, the Coen Brothers film. I just absolutely love that film. I obviously love Deacons and I think, you know, both them and him just have this incredible, incredible way of doing completely motivated, completely realistic, you know, lighting and storytelling, but it's always just beautiful and just perfect for the moment and just and beautiful character stuff. And I just think that film has the most amazing characters in it, you know, the most, it's, uh, yeah, it's just I remember I saw it in Adelaide actually quite a few years ago. I was on a job in Adelaide and I had a day off and I went to the cinema and I watched that film and I just I was just blown away. And I remember the credits rolling and then the music kicking in and going, oh, shit, that's the first music I've heard in the, in the whole film. That's amazing. It was, yeah, there's something about that film which is it's just haunting and it's got everything, mm-hmm. you know, and that Kelly or the Clavier Bardem and Tommy Lee had this most incredible performances. So, yeah, if I had to name one, I'd. I'd probably name that. Yeah, no, that, that's a great fil- choice. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, that film really uh, captures, uh, I'd say, other elements that you'd probably not seen in other films dramatically that it's it, both from a cinematography but performance-wise that they, you know, almost withdraw from some of the, I uh, wouldn't say cliches, but formulae ways of performing a particular emotional scene. And that film really takes a different tangent on that. So the Coen brothers really push their sort of that stance because I know like, yeah, they, people always refer to them as a bit quirky and out there filmmakers, yeah. but that particular film, yeah, it definitely had that, has a different tone than all the other films, even though right. they're all weird too or different or interesting. So, yeah, that's no, a good choice. Um, so I, I think, uh, yeah, we've had a really good chat and uh, we went for a good time. So thank you so much for I talk too much. No, no, it's it's great. I think really, listeners, you know, this is the kind of this is the reason why I wanted to do this podcast to really be able to understand. And you know, for me, it's a learning thing as well. But have the opportunity to talk to people and and just hopefully the listeners will 
really get something out of it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. It was fun. Wow, that was amazing. So much insight into Earl's career and his experiences. So that's goodbye for me from today. And thank you again for listening. Mm-hmm.